How splendid that in this troubled, loony, beautiful world, each of us finds a particular thread of passion to make it a better place. For Ed Vesters, he climbs high mountains and then comes down and tells those of us who live at very modest elevations all about it. For each of you, each of you has chosen from the infinite threads of what you could a particular passion in the arts or the sciences, in education, or in child rearing. Uh, for me, my challenge, my particular passion, is to try to narrow the widening gap between nature and humans. I see this in the closed faces of urbanites who don't hear the sounds of city birds. I see this in the unnecessary gnawing at the forests of our mountains and the, the fishes of our seas. I see it in the reduced amount of funding we have for conservation and for scientific inquiry. I think when we try to face these problems, we tend to go narrower and narrower. And these threads of passion that we have become more and more focused and more isolated from other disciplines. But I think that the poem of Rabindranath Tagore, this tiny poem, tells us that there might be another way to solve these big issues. The tapestry of life story is woven with the threads of life's ties, ever breaking and joining. And in recent years, I have adopted an approach to deliberately conceive and intentionally weave different disciplines together in order to create a tapestry that will solve my problem. A tapestry, after all, is an entity, but with the threads of its constituents still distinct. It is something that is complex, something that is useful, something that is strong, and above all, something that is beautiful. My particular interests are in trees and forests. And forests themselves are actually, I think of them as tapestries, because they are also complex, useful, strong, and beautiful. And they too are an entity, but they are made up of individual threads, of colors, of species, and of critical interactions. And it is my work in this world to try to understand them and to communicate their importance to us so that we might become more responsible and more intimate companions to trees. I come by this uh, tapestry thinking honestly. I'd like to introduce you to my parents. My father is, from, uh, is a Hindu from India. Uh, he's a pharmacologist, did cancer research. And my mother is an Orthodox Jew from Brooklyn, New York, and she studied Romance languages. And somehow, they taught us five kids that, in fact, different religions, different nationalities, and different pr pr professions can live together in harmony. As a child, I had two loves. One of them was trees and nature, and I climbed trees when I was a little kid just about every day. And the other was modern dance, because I found great joy in the interpretation of all life being transformed into music. I ultimately took on the profession of forest ecology, but that joy of dance and movement has never left me. My particular focus in learning about forests is the forest canopies, that is the rainforest roof, what is called the last biotic frontier on planet Earth. And at the time when I first started my studies, it was virtually unexplored from a scientific standpoint. My uh, study sites have been in Washington State and in Costa Rica. I learned how to shoot lines into tall trees and ascend them using modified mountain climbing techniques. And since then, for the last 25 years, my students and I have come to understand that the plants and animals that live in forest canopies play critical roles in terms of the forest ecosystem as a whole, critical threads in that tapestry. We learned, for instance, that they are prominent in pollination and fruit dispersal, but they're also very important, canopy biota are very important in terms of keeping our world climate stable because of their role in the sequestration, that is the storage of large amounts of carbon. In addition to what I learned scientifically from being in the canopy, from my treetop per perches, I also saw images like this of increasing deforestation, of forest fragmentation, and these I realized were tearing rents into the fabric of the forest canopy. One approach I took was to do education. In 1994, I thought I could provide information to the general public by forming the International Canopy Network, a nonprofit. Uh, we consulted to the media. We spread information about it. 
But I realized after a few years that these traditional media were really only getting me to traditional audiences. That is, people like you who already know that trees and forests are very important. And so I began to challenge myself to think about how I could exert canopy actions. That is, weaving my world of science, my thread of science, into other other parts of a, of a forest canopy or a forest tapestry bringing together art, religion, economics, and social justice in terms of spreading the importance of forest canopies and ecosystems to other parts of society. As a first project in this, I began what I call now canopy confluences. I bring together forest scientists, with visual artists, with musicians, with creative writers and poets. We spend a week in the forest. I teach everybody how to climb trees. We collect data together. We create art. And we communicate what we perceive in whatever medium is possible to other people. I'll just show you two examples of this. This is a beautiful piece that was created by Bruce Chow, who is the chair of the Department of Sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design. He made this piece called Ether hung it into the canopy of his native Rhode Island uh, forest, and over several months it began to disintegrate and fall down, which I believe conveyed the idea of ephemerality and of dynamics in the forest. I worked with a modern dance troupe from California, San Francisco, named Capacitor, and Jody Lomask, the uh, artistic director, inspired by the tropical rainforest she, she visited um, during our confluence, created a fabulous modern dance called Biome. And this, for me, was so important because it evoked for me, it went back to that interweaving of dance into my life, uh, which then helped to connect directly to artistic audiences. Well, in addition to, trans to connecting with uh, threads of art, I was also interested in connecting threads of science and the importance of tree canopies with religion and spirituality. And perhaps because of my mixed religion, religious background, I could do this really without an effort. Um, I picked up the Old Testament and I began looking for all of the verses that contain the word tree or forest in an effort to understand how trees and forests are portrayed to the followers of that faith. Of course, when you open the Bible in the first book, the second verse, you get acquainted with two trees that are very important, very central to that faith. And those are tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. There are 327 other references in the Old Testament, and these all show, these all document that trees are absolutely fundamental in many aspects of life for the followers of this religion. Trees are adornments for temples, they, are, um, uh, they mark geographical areas, and they are invoked as analogies to God. I decided to go to other religious scriptures, the Talmud, the Quran, the Gita, Buddhist tales, and I learned really that in all religions, trees and forests are very important. I then created a number of sermons, which I offered to, to give to churches and synagogues, and I was able to do that. As you might imagine, it was the Unitarians who first invited this Hindu <laughs> Jew. But from then on, thanks to them, I was able to enter the, the uh, places of worship of many other religions, and I've since given dozens of, of sermons in many other faiths. Well, we looked at artists and with religious uh, traditions. What about those people who are physically kept from interacting with nature? And this is the world of prisons and of corrections. Um, it seemed to me that this would really be one of the most important audiences to bring my messages to. And in 2008, I started a program, a collaboration with the Washington State Department of Corrections uh, called the Sustainable Prisons Project with the Evergreen State College uh, to bring science and sustainability and conservation projects to our state's prisons. Over the last three years, we have been working in six different prisons. We started with sustainable operations. We've initiated recycling, organic gardening, composting, and beekeeping in these prisons. We've been doing, um, we've been also looking at um, bringing in scientists to give lectures in our prisons so that they're exposed to scientific inquiry. And working in collaboration with the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife, we've been working with the inmates to raise the Oregon spotted frog. And just two weeks ago, we released 80 healthy frogs that were raised by our inmates. In addition, we've been working with the Nature Conservancy to grow 200,000 plugs of six species of rare and endangered prairie plants that will be planted out to the relic prairies here in South Puget Sound. 
What we have found is that these inmates, both men and women, embrace the threat of science that we have brought to them. They take great pride in what they are doing and they've done it well. And what seems to me most important is that they see this as important because they're doing something that is more important than just themselves. They are doing something as big as helping the biodiversity of our biosphere, and they understand now how important that is. Our uh, efforts have been recognized by a number of, a large number of, of magazines and media, from Science Magazine to CNN. And for those of you who do subscribe to the journal Playboy, you can catch up with the latest on our Sustainable Prisons Project this month. <laughs> Now that's outreach. So what did we find? What did I find as a scientist? I found that I can not only talk to my fellow scientists about the importance of trees and forests, not only to other people like you, tra traditional audiences, but really to everybody. I have learned that when it comes to knitting together and preserving the fabric, the tapestry of our forests and of nature in our biosphere, there is no one who is not my colleague, whether they are preachers or painters or prisoners. And to me, that is a powerful thing to learn. Well, Tagore's poem tells us that although friends can interweave, they can also break. Forests at times are destroyed by windstorms or by clear cutting. And just two weeks ago, we learned that the funding for our prison project has been cut because of the state budget cuts. And so we are experiencing sort of a clear cut ourselves. That is the nature of tapestry. But we also feel very strongly that we can bring in new threads of support and reweave those so that once again we can return to a tapestry that is complex, useful, strong, and beautiful. As we end this wonderful TEDx event tonight, I'd like to ask you all for a few things. Number one, I would like to ask you to recall the many threads of passion that all of these speakers have provided for us, the roots, the branches, the fruits. Secondly, I would like to ask you to think about your own thread of passion, whatever it might be, and how it might be woven together with those of our speakers to create a collective tapestry that might make this world stronger. And thirdly, I would like to show you how this collective tapestry might begin. And to do that, I would like each of you to stand up. And I'd like you to take the hand of the person to the right and the left of you, clasp it strongly, intertwine the fingers as if they were true threads. And with your hands clasped in friendship and in tapestry making, I would like you to see that you are all now threads of a common tapestry. That it is very easy to reach across, across to people you don't even know, across to other fields, other disciplines, other ways of thinking, other approaches to knowing our beautiful earth. And I would like once again to recall that we are a tapestry, a tapestry whose threads are ever breaking and ever joining. Thank you. <laughs>